Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Lights, Camera, Action Movie Podcast. On today's show, we will be reviewing Star Wars Episode 8 The Last Jedi. This podcast contains spoilers and strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Lights, Camera, Action Movie Podcast. I'm Mike Winkler. And I am Jason Gabasik. Well, we hope you listened to our first podcast uh, on The Force Awakens. And I um, want to let everybody know that we are now officially on iTunes and Google Play. As well as SoundCloud. Correct. And you can find us at the uh, Lights, Camera, Action Movie Podcast. Or you can search our names on there and you will find us. So, um... So here we are. We're finally here for the last Jedi. All right. First, I want to get your intake on this, Mike. What did you think of it? Um, you know, coming into this podcast, I've now seen the movie four times. Um, so uh, I have not had such luck. I've only seen it the first time <laughs> during first showing. Um, looking back at everything right now, though. At least for me, there's so, so much bad that went with all the good. Like? We'll get into that. Don't you worry. Okay. All right. Um, I guess my overall thing on it is that, you know, when I first saw the movie, um, I was bothered by uh, the fact that we really didn't get... Oh, note to everybody, there's spoilers here. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, get your ass out and see it, and you shouldn't be listening to this yet. Plain and simple. So, anyway, yeah, I think the thing that bothered me the most was um, not finding out who Snoke was. No backstory. And uh, Ray's parents' reveal was a little... Um, was it a huge letdown? Oh, yeah. yeah, you know, they're just some poor farmers, you know, that sold her off for drinking money. I mean, again, I guess it makes sense. And I mean, now they're rotting somewhere in Jakku. Because, you know, everything leads back to Jakku. Well, even Luke admitted in this film that Jakku really is nowhere. Exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, I kind of understand the angle here with the uh, with the parents being from nowhere. I guess the angle here is that it's showing that the Force goes beyond just, you know, the Kenobis, the Skywalkers. You know, there's, there's more to the Force, and it reaches further out to the galaxy than just our major characters in the series. I did like that, how they really went more in depth of what the Force actually was in this film. Mm -hmm. More of the origins of the Force. I was happy with that. So, where should we begin? Well, um, let's start off with the uh, beginning of the flick. Uh, Oh, before I get into this too, I want to talk about this a little bit before we get into the movie. I I take it you have heard about some of the fan backlash on this film that's been all over online. Depends on what you mean. Well, first it started off with the the Rotten Tomatoes score. Uh, oh, yeah. How the score on Rotten Tomatoes is amazing. The feedback from the audience reviews is atrocious. It is the worst out of the entire saga that we have seen for a Star Wars movie. Now. And that's saying something considering people hated the ever-loving shit out of the original trilogy. No. Well, not the original trilogy, out of the prequel trilogy. Yeah. Well, the angle on this here is, and I've re- read some of these backlashes, and I've been looking at them with an open mind. I wanted to get your take on this because a lot of people's backlash seems to be that Luke is out of character here. Do you think Luke is out of character? I mean, this guy went through 30 years of God knows what. He's been through hell. He would act differently. I think any one of us would act differently after 30 years of hell, especially when his own nephew turned against him. And, you know, I'm guessing that you've obviously read the report of what Mark Hamill has said about his Luke Skywalker in this film. He did. He did. Yeah, but he went back and he also said that he was okay with it after the fact. No, here's the problem, though, with this. What did Obi-Wan do after Anakin had ter- after his protege Anakin had turned on him? Sacrificed himself for the greater good. No. What did he do? He ran away on a desert planet oh, and yeah, changed his yeah. name to, you know, so in hopes that no one would find him. Mm-hmm. What did Yoda do when the Empire fell as much as he did as much as it did? 
or sorry, the Empire, Jesus Christ, forgive me, people, <laughs> when everything that had happened, when he didn't even realize that the Chancellor was the Emperor, what happened with him? He went and hid in a swamp. Right. Clearly, running and hiding is the true Jedi way. Well, much like Yoda had said in ep- at the end of Episode 3, he's like, we go into hiding until our presence is needed, which I guess, in a sense... In episode four, they were officially needed, I guess. But, um, I mean, Luke did exactly what Obi-Wan did in this case. And even, Luke even sacrificed himself like Obi-Wan did in the exact same fashion. No, no, not in the exact same fashion. Well, not the exact same way, but I mean... Because I don't remember Obi-Wan, you know, using his Jedi powers in that particular way. Well, Luke is more powerful in this case, yeah. I mean, he sacrificed himself for the Rebellion, just like Obi-Wan sacrificed himself for Luke to get the Obi-Wan vanished into Falcon a out. puff of air when Vader struck him down with the lightsaber. Mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker just killed himself with the Force. Yeah, he used too much power and it basically sucked the life out of him. But he was at peace. He was at peace with what he did, which I think we're going to see his return. Okay. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt he's going to be a Force Ghost on the next film. Oh, there's no question there. I think we're going to see more than him, too. But we'll get into that as we get towards the end of this show. All right, but um, let's go on. Yeah, let's begin where we began here. So the movie opens up with a the Resistance leaving their home from the end of Force Awakens. And the new ship, what is it, What is that called again? The... Um, the big, the big new Star Destroyer. That was the uh, the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought, yeah. The Dreadnought comes in, getting ready to fire onto the planet to eliminate it. The ships just get away just in time. But before that, we get this exchange with uh, with Poe and uh, General Hux. As much as I loved the whole comedy aspect of what happened there, I do you want to go ahead in the detail of what exactly happened? Well. In the scene, let's break down the scene for you. Poe is trying to distract Hux so he can charge his ship to go full speed into the into the dreadnought. But this leads to some jokes being led by Poe. Basically, a mother joke is thrown in there. Uh, instead of calling him Hux, he's calling him General Hugs, um, and uh, he's pretending that he can't hear. And you know, Hux. General Hux going on a on this major rant about how they how him. And the rest of the First Order are going to obliterate the remains of what is left of the Resistance. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll wait. Is General Hux there? Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, the comedy of that, the timing of that was great, but I'm sorry, that just felt way too childish to me. Well, that, I think honestly, it went, it went too long. That, had to, that really didn't have a place in this, I don't think. Maybe not for the very beginning to open up the film. Especially since the beginning of this film was supposed to be so serious and how the rest of the scene goes on, it gets really serious. Um, So we get past this. And this leads Poe to speed up to the Dreadnought, start taking out turrets and different things. But what he's really doing is he's distracting the Dreadnought so the transports can get away before they fire on the planet. And the biggest issue I had with this too, I mean, which but it does fall into Poe's character... Mm-hmm. Is the fact that he completely just disregarded everything that Leia told him to do. Yeah, he goes Leia orders. essentially told him to get the fuck out. Know when to get the fuck out. This is the moment to get the fuck out. What does he do? Click. Well, it's obvious that Leia's wanting him to become the leader, and she sees with the, with the way he's handling things now, he's far from ready to be that leader. But that leads us through the theme of the whole movie and how that leads to the end of the movie. Yeah. Later on, of course. Um, so this leads to the bomber squad. You got these bomber squads, which oh, this whole thing just irked me to no end. And this is this is mostly just me nitpicking here, but the science of all this makes no fucking sense. Yes, we, it's a movie about the Force and the crazy ass shit that the Force can do, but explain to me something. When you open up Mm -hmm. a ship like that, wouldn't you get sucked out into space? Wouldn't you think that you get sucked out into space, you know, as in it is physics at work there? You would get sucked out into space. Well, the bomb, I know the the bombs. The bombs 
are there's no rhyme or reason that the bombs should have dropped. The bombs will not drop in space. Well, that's true. There's no gravity in space. That's a good point. And, and, and all space movies make that mistake. I mean, this is just a running theme of space movies making this mistake. Star Trek, you know, uh, Battlestar Galactica, and any sci-fi movie or series you can think of makes these same mistakes. Just like there's no sound in space, but yet we have sounds of explosions and ships in space. And that's all done for movie purposes, of course, because who wants to see a movie with no sound in space? Yeah. You know, but... um. So the bombers lead lead to this. They drop the bombs onto the ship after we go through this long, prolonged sequence. So this prolonged sequence. Uh, that's another thing that got to me too is the fact that this chick tried was on that hangar after it opened up. You, no, doesn't again just falls into the oh hey physics are not at work here because she should have been sucked out into space that's at true. that particular that's point true. in time. She should have been sucked out. And then proceeds to, with whatever it was, manage to drop all the bombs, but all that explosion and everything should not have happened. None of that should have happened. Again, falls into bombs. Do not drop in space like that. Gravity does not work like that. Not that's space. True. That's true. I, I, I agree with the whole gravity and physics thing. Because, you know, that, that that's, again, that's movies making, you know, typical mistakes, but... All right, so we get I mean, to where, let's move on from this. Let's move on to where they get away. Yes, they take out the Dreadnought and they all get away. And then we have General Hux, who's pissed about this. Oh, he's surprised as shit. His look on his face is priceless. And then he, and then he gets a message from one of his uh, cronies. Supreme Leader Snoke would like to speak to you. And he goes on about, uh, I'll take this in my quarters. <laughs> you nope. just see the giant hologram of Snoke right there in front of you. And you just get the idea of just how strong that Snoke really is. Because with the hologram alone, Hux goes down in a crumpled heap. I mean, he falls on his face and it sounds like his face fucking cracks his bones crack it's it's kind of funny but yeah you're right snoke shows his true power here which reaches far beyond you know just you know the common area that force users usually use it for i mean it's reaching how far we don't know exactly Mm -hmm. um so after this sequence uh finn wakes up from his injuries from the force awakens and he goes to Poe and asks him where Ray is, and this leads us to back to the island. This leads us to Poe saying, "Put on some damn clothes." Basically, yeah, it's like I don't want to see you know your dick hanging out here, so you know, you know, whatever. But so this leads us back to the island where we go right where the Force Awakens left off, where Ray is handing Luke the lightsaber. This was one of the funniest moments of this entire movie. This is one of the greatest moments I thought was when Luke grabbed the lightsaber from Ray. He looked at it for a, a good few seconds, looked at her like he was contemplating, mm-hmm. you know, being able to teach again, and he just chucks it over his shoulder and walks away. I thought that was one of the best moments in this entire film because I was not expecting that to happen. <laughs> I had to stifle laughter very badly during this entire scene. Now, I have to ask you, because I've actually heard some opinions on this scene, and especially from somebody uh, actually yesterday that told me that they didn't like this scene because they felt like... This is where they felt like the first part of Luke being out of character was. They felt like him tossing his father Anakin's lightsaber like that, he would never do that, they say. That's what that's what the the, the, the opinion that I got from that. From... Oh, man. They... He would never do that. Luke would never do that, especially not after, you know, <laughs> of the fact that 30-plus years ago, he he was training a, a whole new group of Jedi together to bring back the Jedi mm-hmm. Order. Mm-hmm. And not just so happens, you know, just not like his his nephew or anything got, or his, yeah, his nephew got fucked up in the head mm-hmm. and completely wiped everyone out, burned down the temple, and went on to become Kylo Ren. 
It's not like that wouldn't fuck with his head or anything. He would have absolutely nothing to do with the Force at that point. Well, he that, would have absolutely nothing to do with the Jedi Order at that point. That's how I view it. I view it in the sense of he throws this lightsaber at this point because he is so disgusted by everything right now, it's almost like he's tossing it like, all right, I want no part of this. I, I don't even want to... Exactly. You know, that, that's how you got to look at it because that's the way it's supposed to be perceived. You know, this this has been the whole argument with the whole Luke thing that just, it it, it it's ridiculous. The whole thing's ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I thought that part was interesting because it, it, again, it was unexpected. You know, at this moment, the music's building, you think he's going to hold the saber, and he's going to basically go, my precious, you know, like a Lord of the Rings moment, exactly. and he just fucking tosses the saber over the cliff. It is. <sighs> and then let's go on to further into this scene here. Okay, so Ray's surprised by this. She's following Luke down the hill after this, and he walks right into his hut, closes the door on her, she's knocking on it, and no answer. No answer. He's saying He says something after we get the shot of him inside of yeah. the uh, hut, and then you just see the door fly open. <laughs> You see the look on his face, like, what the hell? And Chewie. And you just see Chewbacca just appear. Mm-hmm. And he asks where Han is. Yeah. That was a sad moment when he the realization hit him that Han Solo had died. Which, the, which really speaks to the message. You know, throughout this movie, you know, we find out that Luke's been disconnected from the Force. People, people would ask, well, wouldn't he have known that Han was dead? Well, this explains it. He's been so disconnected himself from the Force that he doesn't know what happened to Han. He's allowed himself to be broken off from it all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, we forgot to mention, too, the first appearance of the Porgs before Ray picks up the lightsaber off the end of the cliff that he threw threw it. (laughs) And the look on... Well, this is another thing that got me, too, is when it was nighttime and you see Chewie sitting at the fire Mm, getting ready to eat and you see the Porgs just sitting there looking at him with these beat doughy little eyes. Baby doe eyes. And you just see him start yelling at them to pretty much go so he can eat. Mm-hmm. And then he just sits there and discusses like, can't do it. Can't, can't fucking do it. do it now. Can't do it. That's a funny scene too. Um, but yeah, the, the, those porgs are, are actually quite funny. They, they don't reach into too far territory. They're just enough of them. I think throughout. So, okay, so after Luke finds out what's happened to Han, um, this leads us back to the Resistance. I'll say this right now, that the parts that involve Kylo Ren, Luke Skywalker, and Rey, easily the best parts of this movie. They 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 were so well acted. Their interaction with them seemed so genuine. Well, we can say two things right here, right now, on this show. And, And I don't care what anybody says about the movie. Adam Driver's performance as Kylo Ren is phenomenal. He steps up a whole notch here. And this is by far Mark Hamill's best performance as Luke Skywalker. Easily. And, you know, everything involving Poe, I thought was good. Oh, Poe's great, too. He did good. Minus the little quirks here or there that I didn't like, like I said, that whole comedy shtick that went on way too long at the beginning of the movie. Yeah, yeah. I thought he did good. Mm Mm-hmm. It's what we're getting ready to discuss here that pissed me up. That this that led into the third part of this movie that really just irked the ever loving hell out of me. And that would be Finn and Rose. Oh boy, we're gonna disagree here. We're gonna have some disagreements here. I but, thought but... that was the absolute worst part of this movie. Any interaction with those two being shown mm-hmm. on this film was Horrible. Now, I'm going to ask you, is part of the driving force of that is because you were a Finn Ray hookup lover? No. Okay, I had that. No, it's been they a lot of just felt way angles. too forced. Way too forced with everything that Finn and Rose had done in this film. Everything. They went, and all of their parts that were in this movie, mm-hmm. their scenes were way too long. See, Cut them down by at least half. Now, to, to me personally, I, Rose became one of my... One of my top, at least top seven, top eight favorite characters in this, in this universe, because I found her to be likable, funny, she matches with Finn perfectly, and 
her knowledge and what she does to help the resistance makes her an asset to all this. She's useless as tits on a boar. She's part of the reason why they were able to possibly deactivate that device that was tracking hyperspace on that ship. Without her, they would have had no options. She's as useless as tits on a boar. Okay, well, we'll agree to disagree. But, um, we'll get into that here in a minute. Okay, so, and, well, not in a minute, in a little while. Okay, so we, we leave here. We go back to um, the Resistance. Um, they think they're safe. Uh, Poe gets bitched at by Leia because he didn't follow orders because they lost so many ships in this in this dreadnought battle. And he gets demoted to captain. Correct. And this leads to the First Order coming out of hyperspace with them, and they've been followed, and they find out they've been tracking their hyperspace. Which I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Then you see... Uh-huh. I, I, the way they did that was just amazing. It's like, why wouldn't have any other film thought of doing something like that? Yeah, I, I mean, I used to watch um, Battlestar Galactica, and they used to do things that are that are similar to it, but nothing to that full degree. But that was brilliant. I agree. Um, the fact that they had the technology, and actually, I found out that this was hinted at in Rogue One. There is a scene where Jin... Jiren Urso is going through the blueprints of the Empire when they're trying to de- uh, send the Death Star plans at the end of the movie. Yeah. She's looking through blueprints, and she sees that they have possible blueprints to tracking hyperspace. Okay. So they it's almost like Rogue One was immediately already hinting at this coming. Well, it would be interesting, interesting to think about, because maybe there really were elements in Rogue One that were shown in this film that Uh we just wouldn't have ever thought of. Right. But now we get to the part where Kylo Ren goes up to Snoke's chambers. Oh, yes, yes. This happens happens before they track him into hyperspace. This is actually just shortly before. Um, This was a scene where I was expecting to get a lot of Snoke insight. And you see Snoke laughing and be like, oh, so... That's the ace in the hole, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and you find out to be the revelation of, you know, they have the light speed tracker. Yeah, because... It's kind of like, but this is your ship that's tracking them. You're on this ship. How do you not know this, Snoke? How do you not know the layout of your own ship? How do you not know that you have a light speed tracker on your ship? Well, it makes me wonder, too, because when, when Kylo gets up on the bridge... Snoke is talking to Hux before he walks past, gives, you know, Kylo that smirk. So, I, Hux was, I guess, informing Snoke that they, you know, nothing to worry about, we got it tracked. It's true, why didn't Snoke know about this? Now, I don't, I never really made it clear, was the tracker on Snoke's ship? I guess it was. It was supposed to be on Snoke's it ship. It was on Snoke's ship. But, here's a plot, this to me is a little bit of a plot hole, though. Because, when the Resistance left, the system where the Dreadnought was, that's where they supposedly tracked them, right? Snoke's ship was not there. Snoke's ship was the one that had it, though. Yeah. So they were able to lead every other ship in the First Order yeah. there. Okay, so if, if if what I'm saying is that if... They make it sound as though is that they're able to trace it once the ship goes into hyperspace. hyperspace. But when the ship went into hyperspace, Snoke's ship was not present there. That makes no difference. The soon, as soon as the Resistance went into hyperspace, yeah. as soon as they went into light speed, Snoke's ship picked up on that, and they were able to lead everyone there. Okay, yeah, that's that's entirely possible. They don't elaborate on that, but yeah, that's entirely possible. I guess it could be. But, but going back to... Going back to that scene now. Yeah, going back to that scene. On that bridge. Uh, this was a great scene because this is where the first time we actually get to see a, you know, face-to-face confrontation with Kylo and Snoke. And Snoke essentially rips into Kylo Ren, saying that, you know, how he's still weak. His training isn't complete. Mm-hmm. Killing his father has done him no good. And that Snoke still sees him as this broken shell of a human. Mm-hmm. He's not fully embraced the dark side, in a sense. 
and he essentially sends Kylo Ren off to off with his tail between his legs. Uh-huh. He, he basically hurts his pride to the point where he calls his mask a juvenile, which leads Kylo to smashing the shit out of it in the elevator. Which breaks the mask. Permanently. We don't see this mask the rest of the film now. And this leads to this next scene. Uh, are you talking about which part? At Right after... Snoke's ship had followed them through hyperspace. Oh, when you're talking about when the Tie Fighters come out of the of of the the ship and, and Kylo's, Kylo's leading the yeah Kylo Ren yeah. is leading the charge. Yeah, this is interesting because the trailer hints at this. You essentially see half of the Resistance just go up in oh yeah blaze in this. Film. Kylo's ship goes through the hangar and destroys all the X wings and the A wings and the Y wings in there, basically only leaving Poe. It, they have absolutely nothing really left there to fight with, at no, least. No, they're completely destroyed and dismantled at this point. And they, we find out that they have very limited fuel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this leads to a whole... This this whole movie leads to this point, which really. Is, that's a, which, side thing, that's another thing that really got me is nitpicking-wise is just the fact that the ship is still going to move. You don't need fuel to move. Well, it'll free fall, but they've got no power, basically saying that the Star Destroyers will eventually overtake it and the cannons will be able to destroy them. It'll still move, they're but not... they'll be they'll be dead in space. Yeah, they're still gonna be moving though. I mean that's not like it's not like that's gonna matter. They're okay, they're gonna be destroyed. They're they're making it sound like oh the ship's just gonna stop dead in its tracks the second they run out of fuel. Well, I don't think it's so much. Yeah, well, they won't stop dead in its tracks. Just the, the Star Destroyers will catch up to them because the ship will slow down so slow that the Star Destroyers will easily pick up on it and destroy it. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. It wouldn't completely stop in its tracks. It would just be free fall in space. It would be floating like a human being basically would. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we get to the point where we see everyone on the, that's with the Resistance that's, that has power, like Admiral Akbar, Leia... Oh, yeah. A few others that are sitting there. And then we see Kylo Ren and his ship come soaring in, getting ready to have it locked on. To pull the trigger on the bridge. To pull the trigger on the bridge to destroy it. And you see Leia notice it and look up and see, realize that that's Kylo's ship. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like she was silently pleading, like, don't do it. Yeah, it was like one little four, it was like a force meld between both of them in that moment. Um, but Kylo resists. He does not pull the trigger. Doesn't but pull the trigger, but he has that two Tie Fighters that do. He has that moment where he really questions it whether he doesn't think he can go through with it mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the two. And then the two Tie Fighters come in and come in and destroy the bridge. Which leads us to which one leads of us the... To Le or we're not near that yet. Which leads to Leia everybody and else everyone else in out. that bridge being sucked out, which... Continuity, people. We'd like some continuity with this film. Anything would be great to see. They get sucked out into space the mm -hmm. second that that bridge gets blown up. Mm -hmm. But the bombers in the beginning of the movie... Hmm. Well, yeah, again, that, 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 that's some continuity issues along with, you know, space physics and stuff. The, the, the science part of this Which, is Which, I'm flawed. sorry, I'm just going to put this out here real quick. This seemed, this movie seemed nothing more to me like Ryan Johnson looking at J.J. Abrams, whipping his dick out and be like, whose is bigger? What? <laughs> it's going to be better. Who can undo who? Well, and in this really, case. I do not want. That to happen in this case, this Abrams is going to win this because of who gets the final word as to how this whole thing ends. But it's essentially it's a film. It this trilogy has been nothing more than let's undo the other person, oh. and it that is such a load of shit because oh. that is taking away from a perfect series. I think. Well, you're it's, but it's like you're saying that that both movies are suffering and they're not worthy of being a part of this thing. It's not, I'm not trying to mean it like that. I'm saying it just takes away from the movies. You mean the, the you mean the physics? You don't want the physics aspect. No, and right? just the way just Ryan Johnson's directing style in this movie 
it was certain parts of just like they were he was trying to take away from everything that J.J. J. Abrams did in The Force Awakens. Well, again, I guess that goes back to the way Snoke and Ray's parents were handled. I mean, that that's why I mean, that's why I'm kind of happy that that J.J. J. is taking this last movie on because now he gets to basically finish everything that he basically did in Force Awakens. Which, I don't but, know why they didn't just have one person direct the entire new trilogy. It, yeah, I mean, it, at the very least, if they were going to they were going to change directors, Shouldn't have the same person at least have written all three movies? Therefore, the director couldn't really do much because the script was written. You would think. Yeah, that would have been the smarter approach, and that's the way that should have been done. And I'm, that, that's why I was glad that um, um, what's his name, Colin Colin Tur- Turvero was supposed to direct and write Episode Nine. He's the same guy that did Jurassic World, and he ended up getting fired by Lucasfilm because of creative differences. Some people are saying now it's because Ryan Johnson provided so many questions at the end of 8 that uh, Tevoro was in a corner and didn't know what to do. I don't know if I believe that. Tevoro's past history, from what I read, he had some disputes with different people about creative visions and other films, and apparently he was difficult to work with in that sense. And if you look at the history with what Lucasfilm is doing now, look what happened with Rogue One. They had issues with Rogue One. They had to do reshoots. They hired another director to, to finish the movie off. Then you had this Han Solo movie coming out. The two directors that were there get fired late in production. Ron Howard comes in and finishes the movie, and now we're being told that not only did he do extensive reshoots, he reshot most of the movie. So Lucasfilm basically doesn't like directors coming in and screwing with what they intend the series to be. The biggest problem, though, is that it doesn't matter how you do this, unless you f- essentially Lucasfilms tells Disney to go fuck off, mm-hmm. that's what's going to happen. Well, th- from what I understand, Disney doesn't have much creative control in this. Lucasfilm, which is Kathleen Kennedy's the president, she runs the day-to-day operations, she approves the script, she approves the stories, the directors, yes, but whatever. It's Disney owns Lucasfilms. Right. They're ultimately going to have the final say. They have some final say, but it's just like There's with Marvel. not some. They have control over Lucasfilms. They could easily be like, no. Look look at Marvel as an example. Kevin Feig, who writes the comics, runs Marvel. Nothing is done without his say-so. He doesn't even go through Disney. The only thing he goes through Disney on is based upon how far he can stretch it based on the audience they're trying to appeal to. Kids teens, adults, whatever. Now, Kathleen Kennedy, from what I understand, has the same power as Kevin Feig does. She should, because Lucas Lucasfilm is just as powerful as Marvel. You know, Marvel's not outdoing Lucasfilm. The only reason why Marvel might is because they've made more movies than Lucasfilm right now. But that's well, yeah. about the only reason why. But the issue here is, is that you, 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 you nailed it on the head. The same person should have been making all three of these movies. They shouldn't have been hiring different directors. That was the first mistake they made. Which, what was the reasoning behind them not bringing J.J. Abrams back for episode 8? Apparently he didn't want to do it, and according to Lucasfilm, they wanted to bring in new directors to bring their own style to each movie so each movie could feel semi-different from the other. But why wouldn't they just do that for the spin-offs? Why 7, 8, and 9? I agree. I agree with that 100%. They should have had one director for this entire trilogy... Mm-hmm. bring other directors in for any other movies like Rogue One, like the Han Solo movie, mm-hmm. like anything they do beyond this point, which I'm still hoping to, I'm praying to God that they do an Old Republic film. Yeah, we're all hoping for that, and that's what I was hoping Ryan Johnson was going to do with this new trilogy, but now I think I know where he's going. I think his new trilogy is going to be about the Force. That's where I think he's going with this. At least it appears like it, the way this movie ends. We'll get into that later, but, all right, so we're getting way off topic here. Um, Okay, so this leads us to the moment, one of the biggest moments probably in the Star Wars franchise history. And that's Leia looking like she's on the verge of death, should have died by this point, Mm -hmm. you know, because no oxygen, anything in space. Well, no, no ordinary human would survive this, but she's not ordinary, so. And she uses the Force to bring herself back in to the bridge ship. Finally. Finally, we see Leia use the Force for the first time. Took eight movies to do it, but shit, we finally get to see it. 
what a moment this was. I was giddy in my seat. Not only that, you saw everyone in the theater start clapping. Oh, the, the, the theater was full of applause. The audience was just eating this up. This was one of the things I thought that Ryan Johnson did well, was this scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that and something else we'll get to in the very end that was just downright awesome. But we'll get to that later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this leads to that. So, Leia gets goes back into the ship, but she's still kind of in a semi-coma knocked out, so they have to put her in a medical bay until she wakes up. So, at this point, she's essentially relieved of her duties until she is better. Right. Which leads us to a whole scene where it makes me think that, you know, Poe is about to be picked as the next leader of the Resistance. He, even he thought so, because he's surprised by who's leading it. This Admiral, or Vice Admiral Hondo. The lady with pink hair. Um, why don't you go ahead and explain uh, Vice Admiral Hondo to us? Well, Vice Admiral Hondo, apparently she was running um, command on another ship, and she was Leia's protege. It sounds like within this film that Leia took her under her wing and kind of showed her how to lead because there's a line later in the movie that hints at this. And um, with this sequence, too, I feel like this is important. At this point in the movie, Poe is not ready to run the whole thing. He's just not ready. He he's he doesn't understand what sacrifice need to be made. He's all about what we can do to take down this or this or that, and he doesn't really think about the sacrifices that are being made. But, um, so Vice Admiral Hondo takes over. She lets the Resistance know with this speech that um, they are the spark that will light the fire that will bring the First Order down. The Resistance will thrive on this. And her her mission here is just to keep going and keep going until you know, they figure something out, which, again, we find out what her plan is later on as well. Poe's not happy about this, and this leads to them verbally getting into it. And this leads us into... I believe this next part was more of Ray and Luke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... This leads... Well, considering that you've seen it four times, you should know a little bit better than I do. Well, okay, so when we finally get back to Ray and Luke, um, Ray is following Luke around on the island, seeing the way he lives his life. Um, he basically he swings to one from one cliff to the other, hunting a fish, killing a fish. He's carrying it through the rain. And then there's this weird sequence where... He goes over to this creature and milks it, milks the nipples, squeezes it into like a thermos cup, and he's drinking the milk. <laughs> Four nipples. I mean, you got that whole little bit there, but I think it's more along the lines of, in this next sequence, you see Ray and Kylo Ren. Mm -hmm. After that whole sequence, mm -hmm. they... Became like their minds just started getting connected by the force. Mm -hmm. It's almost force like melt. they could see each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was something that was very interesting, and and you know I I liked this because you could see these two had a kind of a force bond in the Force Awakens. There were scenes where I felt like it was it was hinting to towards this happening. So Ryan Johnson took this in a good direction. Something that we had never seen before. We've never seen a force connection between, you know, two people. I guess I guess Luke and Vader kind of had that, but it wasn't as no, deep as this. No, because Kylo Ren even explained that, you know, the amount of concentration that this would have taken, the amount of right energy that this would have take told the mind with, would have killed you. Correct. Yeah. This was. There's nothing we've ever seen before has been this this strong like this before. Um. That, the, that leads to, basically, Kylo explaining to Rey, you know, has Luke told you what had happened? You know, of course, at this point, she doesn't want to believe anything he says because of who he is. And, she and knows that's who he is. where we find out about Rey's parents. Um, kind of. We don't really... Well, yeah, we find out really about Rey's parents right here. How they're... How they were nothing. Well, we don't find that All out until the throne room, though. We don't find that out to the third act of the movie. Out, 
sooner, I thought. Mm-mm, no, he, he go in the third act of the movie when they're going up the elevator. Uh, Kylo tells Ray that I know who your parents are, and then after they kiss, okay, so, okay, okay. So yeah. all right, let's go back from here. But we get our first glimpse at that. Then the next scene that we get is. Ray confronting Luke about all this. Yeah, she 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 gets called to the Force Tree, and she goes inside, sees the Jedi texts. Luke comes in, and he's wondering who she is, and she's doesn't really understand the question, and he keeps asking her, you know, what are you doing here? What are you yourself doing here? What makes you special? What are you doing here for your purpose? And this here here she explains, you know, the Force has always been inside her, but something awoke inside of her recently, which was in the Force Awakens. And Luke is resilient to train her. He's like, you need to teach her, but I'm not doing it. And it's at this point where we see just how, like, somewhat how strong that Ray could really be. Because mm-hmm. Luke agrees to give her three lessons. Yeah, when he finally does cave into teaching her, which. That was a good sequence, too, because he goes on to the Falcon the first time, and he's sitting there, and R2 approaches him, which was a great moment that was reminiscent of the original trilogy. It was nice to see that moment. Exactly, because it's the, it, it's the reunion of R2 and Luke. Well, especially when R2 shows, in order to get him, he shows him the hologram of Leia from Episode Four. That was a great yeah. nostalgic moment. Um, so this leads to Luke finally deciding, okay, you know, I'll train her. And wakes up and agrees, you know, three lessons. But these three lessons are not going to be for you to become a Jedi. These three lessons I'm going to teach you are going to be... why the Jedi should die. Correct. Correct. So this leads to her first lesson, which is her meditating on a cliffside. Which there, here, here again, there's some humor, which I found to be actually really funny. Which, I want to hear this. Um, when she's on the ridge and she's... And she's uh, has her legs crossed. Luke says, you know, close your eyes and uh, reach out. And she reaches her hand out, and he uses the plant and says, you feel that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's the force. You feel that? And then he whaps her with it in the hand. That was a nice little bit of comedy. But then when you actually see, you know, her getting serious, and he goes, and he asks her, you know, what do you see? Mm -hmm. What do you feel? You just see this image of down below where they are, Mm -hmm. this huge cavernous hole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this is a neat sequence. Almost like a representation of, you know, the dark side calling to her. Mm -hmm. And how... Accepting she is of it. Yeah, of how accepting she is to it. And when Luke pulls her out of it, you see the look on his face... It's just, and this is why. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't want to train you, because whatever you want, you want more than, you know, staying away from the dark. Now, this scene's very reminiscent of, did you get, like, a a Empire Strikes Back vibe when Yoda was training Luke? Between the humor and then the seriousness all molded into one. It was very much an Episode Five sequence, which was uh, really cool. Um, But, yeah, that was a good sequence, because I liked it, because as she's... um, seeing things in her mind on the force we're seeing little shots of of plant life we're seeing you know shots of peacefulness and then some violence and then and then which leads to that part that you said with the the darkness with the hole in the ground and then luke's explanation of he had only ever seen one other person with that strong of a connection to the force and that was kylo ren yep he explained how he wasn't afraid of it then. He is now. Mm-hmm. Because now he's seen what the true power really can be and how dark it is and how powerful. Um, so with this sequence, uh, well, we might as well go to this now because we're now to this. Uh, the scene where Finn picks up the tracker from Leia, which is being used for Rey to find her way back to the Resistance, and he's about to go on an escape pod, and we first meet Rose. Now, me personally, I liked this scene. I liked this scene. I think it was kind of funny and humorous. I and I, yes, it was funny and humorous. It went on way too long. And personally, the way that they used Rose in this film, I think, was wrong. 
she shouldn't have been this big of a player in this film. I do not agree with how they used her. I think she should have been a minor character at best. Sure, keep her around for, you know, sporadic appearances throughout the next couple of films. But do not use her the way that they used her. Because it just honestly had what... To me, this is... Rose is my Jar Jar Binks to everyone else. Oh, no, 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 no. That's too far. You're comparing Rose to Jar Jar Binks? I mean, that's a little much. People have their unbridled hatred to Jar Jar Binks. I have my unbridled hatred to Rose. Uh, I do not like her at all. Okay. The way that they used her was just horrible. Well, we're we're in complete opposites of that. See, you feel like she was. I feel like she was used fine, but we both have our angles and our views on that, and I respect yours. Um, I think Jar Jar's a little far, but I do like how you know she see she sees Finn. She talks him up about you know how he's this big hero of the resistance, how he was able to escape the first order, be able to stand and still fight them. Mm -hmm. And she says all this as Finn's getting into the escape pod. And she's like, what are you doing? And you know, he goes on explaining, I'm just checking to make sure everything's working Mm -hmm. on the inside of the escape pod. One of the heroes of the resistance checking the inside of the escape pod, get him getting in and doing that, and then proceeds to shock him and cart him off mm-hmm. to everyone else. Yeah, see, I love to this show part. That. I, I love this whole sequence. I just think it's... Like, that, I had no issue with. It's everything else involving the scenes that they were in, I just did not like. Okay. All right. Well, okay, this leads us past this part. Um, The discovery of she knows about the hyperspace technology and it can lead them to um, Snoke's ship to disable it so they can get away. So they inform Poe of this, and this leads to... um, Essentially a mutiny. Yeah, yeah. They they, they have to talk to Maz, which Maz is that Yoda-like orange creature, female from Force Awakens, which we called the female... Yoda, which I'm, I'm, I was kind of bummed we only saw her in one scene here because I liked her character and would like to see her more. And it essentially ends up leading to Maz telling him, you know, there's only one person that would really be able to help them, and that's to go on to this essentially gambling planet. Canto to Bite f- to find the Codebreaker. To find the Codebreaker. Mm-hmm. He's the only one that would be able to help them with this. Right. So, we go back to, uh, essentially we come back to Ray and Luke yet again. Uh, this goes to a sequence where Luke explains to Ray in this cave about, this is where a prequel reference comes in, I was very happy to hear this. Um, where Which Luke, prequel reference was this again? Where Luke explains to Ray. Um, the Jedi Order allowed, allowed a, a, a former Jedi, Darth Sidious, to corrupt Darth Vader and to bring down oh yeah the exactly. oh yeah mm-hmm. that I loved I loved finally minus the one reference in Force Awakens I love the fact that they're bringing up prequel references well, yeah. this comes this comes from Ryan Johnson Ryan Johnson is one of those people which we know there's a lot of people out there that dislike the prequels for whatever freaking reason but Ryan Johnson has come out and said that he loves the prequels. Which is why I think again he makes sure he makes sure to drop a reference that hey prequels exist they're a part of this thing like them or not they exist and I'm bringing them up here yeah mm-hmm. so all right and then this leads to us seeing Ray training with the lightsaber as well mm-hmm. mm. oh yeah just before that in that same sequence she gets Luke to confide in her. Because she says, you know, Kylo failed you, but I won't. And this is after Luke tells her his part of the story about what happened with 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 uh, with Ben Solo and that small flashback we get in the tent. And we get, you know, the 
first little bit of that whole sequence that takes place throughout the film, and it makes it look like, you know, Kylo had essentially gotten up and knocked Luke out. Yeah, he brought the whole building down and caved it in on top of him. Caved it in on top of him, and then by the time Luke came to, all the other Padawan were dead, and... Burned it down. Temple was burnt down. Mm -hmm. Sad. I mean, again, this is another reason why Luke is different, ladies and gentlemen, because thirty years have gone by and this happens. This happens. People, people feel like, oh, the Luke we know from the originals never would have possibly thought about striking down, you know, Kylo. Why not? Look at everything that Luke had seen throughout the years. He saw visions that Ben but Solo was going to kill we're not, people. We're not at that point yet. Well, we're kind of. But not right. really. But we're talking about. Just the first part of the sequence here. Yeah, so we we see this. It leads to that part, seeing the burnt down temple, um, and then that leads into Ray uh, training with the lightsaber for the first time, which we see she's got mad skills with, and even Luke sees it. And it's just, it's just amazing to see what Ray can really do because she's really in tune with this, like we've been saying. Mm -hmm. And then you, you see Luke looking on at this, it's like something's clicking in his head. He's realizing maybe this is my second chance to get it right. In a way. Yeah. In a way. So, um, as we get past this sequence, uh, this leads us to Finn and Rose going to Canto Bite on the casino planet. And again, this was one of the biggest issues I had with the film. Okay. This is... One of the reasons, and honestly, I can't even say, I, okay, I take that back, I can't even say that I truly despise Rose, it's what was brought along with Rose that just killed this movie for me, I think. At least, all the bad parts involving, were essentially all Finn and Rose scenes. Mm -hmm. Because this sequence of scenes on Cantabite were nothing more than moral dilemma after moral dilemma after moral dilemma shoved down your throat. I can agree with one part, especially. Um, it's a sequence that I don't feel like was really needed. Was uh, the part where she really wants to save these animals? I mean, it's almost like it's almost like you Disney. got the mystery. You, you oh yeah, you got that. You got you know the rich getting rich off so, and not caring at all because they're off selling weaponry mm -hmm. and everything to the first order, mm -hmm. which we've later find out that they're also selling to well, the resistance. Yeah, but... But there's that. That's moral dilemma number two. There was like there was another at least two or three others that were shoved down your throat in this. It's like you know that Disney had bought out Lucasfilms with this scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like first example, rich rich people bad. You know, give to the good. You know, number one, number two, animal cruelty bad. You know what I mean? It, it was it was like in, they were shoving down um, meaningful things that you should take to heart. And I, okay. Like, I could, I can understand, you know, one bit, one bit of that stuff here or there, not shoved down your throat in a matter of five, ten minutes. Well, right. It's like, am I for animal cruelty? No, I, I'm all for the message they're trying to speak here. But we don't need this in a movie to to be shown for us. There's places that you do this that you don't throw this into a movie to speak to kids. I mean, exactly. It's that kind of conversation belongs in a school, not put into a movie just for the sake of showing that it's wrong. But anyways. Let's get back to the scene at hand here. Um, you know, so they get to Cannabite. They're looking right. for the code breaker. The code breaker. Uh huh. And they eventually find him. Yeah, he's gambling at a at a craps table. It looks like, uh, and they get stopped by guards that throw them in jail because they parked their shuttle on a public beach. Yeah. So at and then we get to the next bit of sequence here. And, you know, we see, for whatever ungodly reason, Benicio Del Toro in this film. Okay, I'll throw it out there right now. I, when I heard Benicio Del Toro was going to be in this movie, I was excited. And I was not. I didn't even know that he was honestly going to be in this you film. Did, you didn't know this? No. Oh, yeah, this was this was months upon. This was probably more than a year ago he was casted. There, I honestly don't know why 
he was in this film. There was no point. You didn't you didn't like his character? No, not really. Well, I found it kind of I found it kind of humorous. The stutter was kind of humorous. It I mean, yeah, that was kind of humorous. There were some aspects of a character that was humorous. But why? Why was he there? Well, you know, he was there because because of a code breaking to reason. To take screen and... time. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. essentially, we ended up finding out that yeah, he's. Well, he's somebody I feel like is going stronger... to come back, and not like he ends up being. He ends up being the Lando Calrissian of this film, betraying Finn and Rose. Yeah, but yeah. We'll get to that again later. But he just he doesn't become the hero like Lando does at the end of five. You never know. He like well maybe maybe in nine he will be. Yeah, that, that's possible. Either way, I think he'll play both sides just because that's the kind of person that he is. He's the smuggling type like Han Solo once was. So they meet him. The heat. They get into this conversation, and you know, they Finn and Rose want absolutely nothing to do with him. And he kind of takes this card out of his pocket, mm-hmm. picks a seat with him, and was like, that's too bad. Right. And then proceeds to just swipe it and breaks them in out. this lock, and it just unlocks the entire row of mm-hmm. cells. Yeah, and he gets them out, and then he discovers BB-8 uh, took out all the guards, which... <laughs> BB-8, man. BB-8 in this movie is just a bona fide badass. BB-8 is just BB-8. He's more badass than any other droid we've ever seen. Hey, no, don't don't take, don't take away from R2. I, I don't take away from R2, but the thing of it is that the problem I have, though, is that we have not seen R2 be a badass since the prequels. He had jetpacks, he had oil slick, he had a bunch of shit. We didn't see any of that in 4 through 6. It's like R2-D2 got old and decided to retire, or he couldn't do it no more. <laughs> I mean, come on. Well, where's badass R2 that we saw in the prequels? He, he disappears. That's all right. All right, so let's get back on track here, Mike. Um, next scene. Um, well, within Canto Bite, we get this sequence uh, where they free the the animals and they're riding it out of Canto Bite. Now, problem I have with this sequence is this sequence also brings in some mediocre CGI. When they're riding, Go ahead and when they're ri- when they're riding the horse-like creatures out of Canto Bite, and they're riding away from the from the uh, the aircrafts, and they're going through the city and through the fields and the beaches oh, yeah. and everything. There's mediocre CGI here. Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, and that's not normal for a Star Wars movie. We don't usually have mediocre CGI. It's just not. This is the mo- This is this is the part of the movie that the CGI is weird. It's the only part of the movie where we have this problem. All right, now let's get into the next big part of the film here. Um, so after Canto Bite, and they escaped with um, Benicio Del Toro's character, DJ... Uh, we end up going back to the Resistance. Yeah, they're still being chased by the First Order. They're losing you ships. You see, they're, they're, losing their, uh, they're losing their support ships. Mm-hmm. They're losing all their defense carriers. That it, it, It's really not looking good for them. And then we end up finding out more about what Hondo's plan is. Yeah, we if, uh, Finn discovers not Finn, uh, Poe discovers that he, she's feeling the transports and that they plan on escaping from the transport. But the problem here is the transports have no weapons and they have no defense. So he figures that she's running away and she's being you know traitorous or she's being you know a coward. Which leads to the mutiny essentially. Yeah, the fight back against Hondo and basically. Puts her at gunpoint to stun her and says, you know, if she moves, stun him. He's going to take this ship and uh, give Finn and Rose time to come back with the Codebreaker. And so we get to all that. We get through this whole sequence here. And at least so what looks like it's a last stand in the, well, now fixed bridge room, I guess you could call it. Yeah, it's like almost like a second bridge. Like it was a secondary bridge where they could still control everything. I I guess I, you know, because the... and that, but then you see Leia pop back up. Yeah, yeah, that that. Well, let's see. I'm trying to think of the order of everything. She does pop back up. I'm trying to remember anything that happens in between that. No. Not really. Um. Well, she takes back the, Leia takes back the ship and stuns um. Uh, oh. Poe. 
And that leads to the transports leaving the ship, and Hondo stays behind to... Which, this is where we end up finding out more but the relationship between Hondo and uh, Leia. Yeah, we, we, we basically find out that, uh, you know, about the losses, and Leia says, you know, I, I can't accept these losses, and Hondo says, yes, you can, because you taught me how to deal with it. So, um, so yeah, we get the sense that, you know, Leia was really teaching her how to lead... Because I think Leia really was looking looking to see who she could trust to lead the resistance if anything ever happened to her. So it was coming down to basically Poe and Hondo at this point. Um, but so after that sequence, the transports leave, Hondo stays behind. We go back to Rey and Luke, and this is where... Essentially because Hondo has come with the plan of keeping the First Order at Snoke's ship at bay, so that way it buys these tr- carrier ships, these transport ships, enough time to escape. Because we the... find out that, you know, uh, this was... Because, you know, people apparently can't look out a window and see this giant planet sitting there. Well, I, I think I think the people could realize it, but I think Poe was so headstrong with his plan that he just wasn't opening himself up to anything that was around. Where Leia informs him that this planet is the planet Crate, which is an old rebel installation that's been hidden from the First Order slash Empire. So we find out more about that, and then it's almost like the lighting just hits Poe, and it's realizing just how bad things are. Yeah, how what he really needs to do. It's almost like that's hitting him. Mm-hmm. So as as they're going away, we do go back to to uh, Finn or not Finn, uh, Ray and Luke, and this sequence is where things get really interesting because now. Because now you get more of Rey and Kylo. Right, because Kylo's telling her that Luke basically, you know, was trying to kill him. And, and Rey... we see it from Kylo's point of view. Mm-hmm. And Rey starts to kind of maybe believe it a little bit, and she's trying to connect with him. And that leads to Luke seeing them bond. And that leads to that kind of cool confrontation in the rain where they kind of duke it out with the with the, with the the sticks and the poles. Yeah. And she gets Luke to the ground, has a lightsaber above him, gets gets him to stop, tell him the truth. That was a cool sequence. It's kind of cool to see. I, I, mean, I think the one thing that bothers me is that I would have loved to have seen Luke fight with a lightsaber in this movie, which the closest thing we get to it is that that stick fight with Rey. But it's understandable. I mean, I get it. But um, we actually, in this sequence, find out the truth about what really happened with uh, Kylo and, and Luke that and how night. it was just... It was a matter of both. Luke steams himself a failure to stopping Kylo because he felt he needed to. He he felt the darkness in Kylo Ren. Mm-hmm. And, Saw visions of of hate and destruction and death and and he thought it was best for the Jedi Order to kill him right there. Mm-hmm. And when he went to go kill him in his sleep, he hesitated. It's like he couldn't do this. That was when he realized that he had failed as a ma- as a Jedi Master. Now that's interesting because because uh, well, the first time I saw it, I saw it that way. In the repeat viewings, actually, what happens is when Luke sees that vision, he has that split second where he turns the lightsaber on, and then he he doesn't. He turns it off because he decides he's not going to kill him. He kind of backs off from it because he's telling Ray, he's like, you know, for a second I had thought that it was a good thing to do, and then I realized it wasn't. But he looks down and he sees that Kylo saw him turn that saber on initially, and Kylo grabs the saber and goes to swing at Luke, and Luke blocks it. Mm-hmm. So actually, Luke wasn't actually was not going to kill Kylo. He for a second he thought about it, but then he retreated away from it. But then Kylo's hatred kicked in and swung at Luke, and he brought the roof down. Yeah. All right, so then we, after this whole scene, we get to our next moment, and that's with Finn and Rose and... uh, They get back to... Benicio Del Toro being on Snoke's ship. Right, yes, yes. Oh, forgot to mention too, Ray does leave the planet after that with Luke's thing and decides that she's going to try to save Kylo and she she leaves Luke behind. But yes, then you go into that part. Um, yeah, so... so this is another weird sequence. It's, 
leads to another thing that I'm going to have major issues with here. Do so tell. It, when we get to the scene, we'll discuss this. Okay, so they sneak into Snoke's ship because uh, Benicio Del Toro's character is able to mask them going in. So they land, and they dress themselves up like First Order officers to basically get into the room to disable the the device. Uh, but that black BB-8 droid notices something weary, and that leads to them being caught in the process of trying to deactivate it. And Captain Phasma returns. Here we go. Yeah, I have a feeling this is where you were going to go. Captain Phasma returns and Here says to Finn, Here we go. One it's of good the to most, have you back. One of the most intriguing characters in this new set of movies mm -hmm. was Phasma. Was such a good character, got such a good reaction out of people. We were hoping to see more of Phasma in this film. We were led to believe that we'd probably end up seeing more of Phasma in this film. Not only that, not only did we not get that, we got even less screen time mm -hmm. in this film, but we also got the... Oh, we also got such a letdown of a fight sequence. Well, it wasn't long enough. I expected the fight sequence to be longer, more drawn out, and it and it ended basically as fast as it started so it up. It made Phasma seem like this just complete and utter badass of a general. It's just complete and utter... I mean, she had essentially chrome-plated uh, Stormtrooper armor mm -hmm. that... that Bounced off any of those bullets, anything. Just bounced right off, just like shrugged it off like it was nothing. Like we'd be able to see more of Phasma doing what Phasma can do. Nope. I'm, I am taking it that Ryan Johnson went, went one of two ways with this. Either A, he didn't know where to fit Phasma into the story, or B, he just outrightly didn't like Phasma and just wanted just to kill her off, which in my my thing is that, okay, if you didn't like the Phasma character, then don't have her appear in this movie at all, and let her come back in 9 when J.J. takes the character back. But he, he apparently, I don't think he knew what to do with Phasma, but felt like he had to put her in this movie, and this was the spot to do it, but then why did you have to kill her off? Wasn't it a little bit soon to kill her off? Why couldn't have she gotten away and build up to a huge confrontation with her and Finn in yeah, episode 9? The big thing that came out of this whole sequence is we see Benicio Del Toro's character betray them. Come up after Phasma was like bring him what he asked for. Mm -hmm, after he exposed the secret of the ships leaving for Crate. At which point you see Hux realize that you know at which point you see Hux start aim telling everyone to aim at the transport ships mm -hmm. aim going towards Crate. Right. You just see the look of despair on not only Poe's face and Leia's face, but on Hondo as well. Mm -hmm. Which leads us to a whole huge sequence starting with um, Ray getting to Snoke's ship. Yes, Ray Ray and the Falcon jump out of hyperspace and she takes a pod to Snoke's ship, which she believes Kylo's gonna recover and they're gonna, you know, form a rebellion against Snoke. But she gets surprised, she sees um Kylo, but stormtroopers have uh cuffs that cuff her up. Leads to an explanation in the elevator where she says, you know, when we touched hands you know, I saw you turning good and turning against Snoke, and Kylo says to her, well, I see you... I, he saw the exact opposite, her yeah. turning evil. He sees her turning the dark side, and that's where he tells her, I also saw who your parents are. Yeah, that was where... And that's where we find out the utter disappointment of their nobodies. Yeah. All this speculation, all the, one of the biggest questions that everyone had... All these theories just thrown out the window. Well, maybe that's kind of a good thing. Nobody saw that coming. It Everybody who thought they knew better actually yes, ended up being the opposite. Yes, but to be that, just to be treated like an afterthought there, like, oh, they were just 
they were just nobodies. Well, I think of this in one of two ways. Either A, they wanted you to believe that the Force extends beyond the major families, or B, there it's one big lie and we're going to find out the truth of it in nine. One of two ways. Which we'll have our theory, we'll do our very, very early theories here at the end of this. Yeah, it'll be very early. Um, but yeah, that leads to that sequence and this leads to the confrontation oh, in the oh, throne room with Snoke. Oh, oh, oh man. This was a cool sequence. This was easily one of the best parts of the film. Oh, probably, probably, if, if, probably, I'd say it's up there with another part we'll get into later. It's probably top two, top three moment of the whole movie. It's where we fully see Snoke and all of his powers. How, just how incredibly strong that Snoke is. He throws her around like a rag doll. He flicks his finger just ever so slightly, and you just see her just whipped around like she's a rag doll. Yeah, yeah. This leads to this whole thing where he eventually ends up keeping her locked in place with the Force mm-hmm. after he takes the lightsaber from Rey. Mm-hmm. Yep, he has his lightsaber right by his side. And keeps it right by her, um, right by him. Mm-hmm. And this is where he presents Ray right to Kylo Ren, right in front of him. And he says this part to uh, Kylo. Go ahead, Mike. He says, uh, basically, this is the point where Kylo Ren fully embraces the dark side. And I see him striking you down and thrusting that saber straight through you. How his... And he says to Kylo Ren how he's he's seen into Kylo and realized that his he realized just how sure he is of his plan. Right. Just how sure he, he's his mind is no longer broken. It's fully embraced into one thing. And he tells Ray, and you know, you you see that he's going to turn, and I can see everything, and there's no intent in his mind to and turn. And we see that you know it was Snoke really the entire time behind. That the mind, little mind melding, yeah, the, the mind melding between the force. Mm-hmm. So this is where we get the biggest twist of the movie that I think nobody saw coming. So when he's talking about, I see him killing my his greatest enemy, which is supposed to be Ray. You see, yeah, Kylo Ren says that lights his sa- lightsaber up. Kylo moves the finger, and the saber that was Ray's goes straight through Snow, cutting him in half. Which that right there was. The biggest, biggest letdown of this film. Well, it's a badass moment, and you know what? The moment would have paid off, I think, even more if we would have known who Snoke was. Then it would have been like, okay, fine. But I think what this really does is like, wait, it's he, like, he's oh, dead? so he's this all-powerful being, and he's dead. And he's dead with no explanation as to who he but is. But it's this fight sequence that we get here between... With Ray and Kylo teaming up with each other. Now, in this moment, I against think against all those Imperial guards. I think in this moment, let me see if I if I know what you were thinking here. I th- did you think in that moment once he killed Snoke? Did you think that Kylo was going to turn good and that was going to be that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people had thought that, which it ends up going the complete opposite direction. But at least we get a moment where they fight together, which is a badass moment. It's just the that whole sequence was amazing. Those Imperial guards, they they are not to be fucked with. No, they got those damn swords or whatever that they, bend the, too. The whips, the whip, the swords that are essentially force whips. Mm-hmm. Just holy shit! Just and the fact, just how strong they were, because wrap it around. I uh, forget whether it was Kylo or Rey, but wrap it around their neck and just one, two, three pulls of this brings them right in, essentially mm-hmm. headlocks them mm-hmm. into place so they can't breathe. Then you see the one Imperial Guard with the two uh, size in her hand, the force, uh, the lightsaber size is just 
my mind is sitting there blown the entire time. I could not stop. I couldn't help but lean forward in, in my seat and just stare intently with really without blinking during this entire sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> those those damn guards were mind blowingly awesome and they're powerful. I could see why they were guarding Snoke, although they didn't do the greatest job because he still died. <laughs> Well, it's because they didn't really see this coming either. No one no, really saw this. No one saw this coming. Even Snoke himself didn't see it coming. So, but I mean. so we get through all this, and really, we, and this is where we find out that Snoke, or that that's not Snoke, but uh, Kylo Ren's plan was, you know, he's his his resolve was he wants to be the person that he needs to be. Mm-hmm. He needs to completely wipe out the past. Yeah, the Jedi to die, the Resistance to die, First Order to die, everything. He wants Rey by his side to be, take control of the whole galaxy, which is the complete opposite of what Rey wants. Rey wants the peace and everything. And, you know, and that's, that's what Kylo really wanted, too, but it was two different opposite ends of where they wanted to go in order to get there. Right. And this leads to the struggle with the lightsaber because they both were using the force on it Mm -hmm. to try and gain control over the lightsaber. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we get another shot of Hondo in the ship. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the most badass part of this whole movie, which she does. Essentially turns the ship around towards Snoke's ship and gets ready to set the ship into light speed. Straight through the force of the First Order ships. Not only put Snoke's ship, Mm -hmm. and at the same time, we're still getting this struggle, and we're seeing the we're seeing the lightsabers start quivering in place. And it looks like starting to crack a bit. Mm-hmm. And as you see that happen, and it seemed like the lightsaber just exploded, mm-hmm. which that was not a comment, but that was that lightsaber that Luke had mm-hmm. all this time throughout the original trilogy. Combust. Combust. At the same time that Hondo full force light speeds into Snoke's ship and just cracks it right in half. Now tell me this too, literally in that part where she goes through the chi- the ships, we literally have ten seconds of pure silence in this movie. Ten seconds of pure silence. When she goes through those ships, we hear nothing. That's what makes it more badass, though. And then we see the cracking of the entire side of Snoke's ship. Yep, a quarter of his ship split. And then this leads us to the scene starting on Crate. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of the Battle of Hoth from Empire. Um, Which, speaking of that, as they get there, one guy had this, because you had to mention Hoth, mm -hmm. one guy gets there, puts his hand on the ground, tastes whatever it was that was the ground was made of Salt. it's like it's not hoth that was just one of the, just one of the random funny lines did, that you couldn't help but laugh at did, did he say how, is that what he said did he yeah i gotta go back and listen to that i gotta go back and listen to that yeah that's interesting if he says it that way that, that <laughs> you're right that would be yeah but um so we get the at or the walkers um, but they're more advanced than what they were in Empire. It's the, we get the ATAT units there. Mm-hmm. We essentially get the mini Death Star, which that was kind of a redundant thing. Well, it was it was old Death Star tech. It was like the the laser they were using was like the same kind of laser they used on the Death Star. But still, it was essentially mini Death Star. It's what we got there. The yeah. cannon mm-hmm. that went to blast a hole in. The Resistance's last line of defense. Right. And as we're doing this, we're get down to the point where the Resistance, led by Poe, are in these old shit. 
run down speed land speeders mm -hmm. and they're all flying towards the first order like Kylo Ren and the first order trying to take them down or stall even for time and they're all just getting blown up one by one and this is where you see Poe just realize like we can't do this just withdraw but Finn doesn't feel the same way and if you see essentially the same reaction that Leia had to Poe, Poe had to Finn right. so during the sequence. You're seeing more of the leader out. He's starting to kind of see things more clearly than what he used to at the beginning of the movie. Um, and this is what, but this is another one of the reasons why I hate Rose with such a passion. Yeah, Because um... this moment here that we had was what looked to be Finn's Heroic final moments. He was Heroic die. final moment. Like, mm -hmm. Finn was going to die. Finn, I think this would have been a perfect moment for Finn to die. Yeah, I, it would have been fitting for him to die in this moment. It would have been heroic. It, because, it, the, because it seemed like that would have been enough to at least stop the laser. Right. The cannon from hitting the base, the, the side of the wall of the base. I think in this point, I think Finn and would that, have served his would purpose. Have, he would have served his purpose. He would have done... He would essentially stop the First Order for time being, right then and there. I guess they're saving him for a more heroic moment in 9, and I suppose. And then you have Rose, who, by trying to save Finn, wipes out what little of the Resistance you really see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because she wanted to save Finn, she wiped out she wiped what out little ship. left of the Resistance. All she did was wipe out his ship, though. All she did was wipe out his ship. Every other ship was gone. By by say, by trying to save Finn from the cannon. Well, right, yeah. With her doing that, she, she allows she the laser to hit. She essentially killed. She allows she laser to hit. killed it. that much more of the resistance. We're down to like ten people left in the resistance. Yeah, at there's this not point. much left at this point. There's we're down to they're down to ten to twenty people. It's yeah, it's pretty pretty bare. But we get to the whole little. Random sequence between Rose and Finn there. Oh, uh, you're talking about when Rose kisses Finn. It's whatever, and passes out. <laughs> whatever, I don't care. Let her die in this next, but in this end part, or in this beginning of the next film, I don't care. Yeah, because she doesn't make die. Any difference to me. But anyway, so this leads to this iconic moment. Yes, so... In this next line of sequences in this film, which I think was the best moment in the film. Yep. Yep. This moment, when the Resistance thinks they're finally beaten, Leia looks down a corridor and sees, sees Luke, where they share their final moments together, and Luke basically says... Luke apologizes for everything that yeah. happened with Kylo Ren. I can't change him, but I gotta stop him. So he basically goes outside, and allowing the Leia resistance realized, to... And Leia, you know, accepts it. Yeah, allowing but the it resistance was not to go only that, ways. It was, we saw Luke look like he was, had cut his hair, shaved up a little bit, like kept, made himself look a little more like he was the leader of the Jedi now. Yeah, it's in this moment... It didn't cross my mind that he looked when you the first same. Saw it. Yeah, he looked the same as he did when Ky Kylo turned bad. But it, I thought maybe he just maybe shaved or whatever. And it was know, when but... Luke stepped out, and right there for Kylo Ren to see the pure, unadulterated rage that Kylo had when he saw him. The most hate we've seen from him. Every single bit of artillery to be aimed at him and fired. Yeah. <laughs> and you see General Hux after he stops like, do you think you got him? Yeah, you think you, think you got him? And then the, the smoke peers up and Luke walks out. And you just out, see Luke just walk up and just like... Pats his arm like, is that all you got? And Ky baits Kylo Ren out. Mm hmm Which, that was funny in itself, just seeing Luke do that to him. Mm hmm Oh, God, yeah. Luke just taunts the shit out of him in this moment. And that leads us to... A hell of a sequence, which was not a lightsaber duel, hinted as it being a lightsaber duel, but was not. But it led us to some, I like to call some Matrix-style moves from from Luke in this moment. Seeing Luke with his blue lightsaber, 
Mind you, the same one that was destroyed. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about this, yeah, we almost should have seen something odd about this, because he's holding a lightsaber that's supposed to be destroyed. Which, remember, I did tell you a couple days later, before you had seen it again, like, did you notice something weird about this by any chance? Yeah. How that lightsaber Luke has is the same one that was just destroyed? That's a good point. That's a good point. No, It's funny, in that scene, nobody pays attention to that when they see it the first time. Nobody pays attention to that moment. And you don't really see Luke doing anything, just dodging. They never make contact. Lightsabers never touch. Kind of just eggs Kylo Ren on. And that's when you see Kylo deliver that what looks to be like that fatal slash to Luke. But yet he doesn't get cut in only half. Only it just goes right through him. Which in that moment I'm like... At which point Kylo's like, what is this? And walks up. <clears throat> puts the saber through puts his Puts the saber chest. through him. And Luke just looks down, looks back at him, and just kind of smirks. And that reveals that Luke is actually on the island planet, floating <coughs> with his with his legs crossed, and he literally is using his Force presence on that planet, which, in that moment, you and I were like, holy shit, but the whole theater erupted. Like, oh my god, Luke has become this powerful. Just makes you realize just how powerful Luke Skywalker really was. Yeah, he really was strong with the Force. I mean, I don't think we've seen powers this strong. I mean, with that, we've never seen powers as strong. But we've never seen a Jedi do something so powerful like that, probably since Yoda. Not even that... Oh, now you see, yeah, now that brings me back. We're going to rewind We're going to rewind here minute. for a second here, people. Um... I can't believe we forgot this part. Wow. Before Luke ends up doing what he's doing, we see him going to the old forest tree... To burn it down. To burn it down, along with the, the original text. teachings mm -hmm. of the Jedi Order. Right. And we see a nice, old, familiar face. This was a warm, warm welcome. This this made me feel so good to see Yoda come back. This was just and not just awesome. not just any Yoda. We see old senile puppet Yoda. Yeah, Empire. Which I'm glad that they didn't go CGI Yoda here because that would have felt again wrong within continuity. CGI Yoda was younger. Puppet one was older. So I'm glad they kind of kept true to that. And we see Luke not be like struggling with himself to. Sure, and we just see Yoda start laughing, and he summons the fucking lightning that just burns the tree and the original teachings. <laughs> yeah, now we know that even when you're a Force ghost, you still have unbelievable powers. I mean, he literally took a bolt of lightning and set that damn tree on fire. And you see Luke looking around like, what did you just do? Like, you can do that? You know, you can do that? You're dead. I don't really, didn't really catch or remember what uh, Yoda said during all this, but it was enough to convince Luke to... To do what he did. Yeah. To have, find the resolve that he needed to. Right. Right, which leads us full circle back to where we were with Luke projecting his image, and he's physically exhausted after this. You see this. him completely just pass, like collapse on the rock, mm -hmm. but he pulls himself back up into a meditative position, Mm-hmm. And you see him, like, the look of resolve on his face. Peace, like, he's at peace. He's, finally he's at did peace, something, finally. Yeah. And then you just see him start fade away. Much like Obi-Wan and Yoda. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask if you noticed this, because I've actually noticed some repeat viewings now. The moment before Luke dies, and he's looking at the sun, did you notice that he was looking at two suns? No. He's looking at two suns, just like he was the first time he looked over the ridge at his uncle... Uncle Owen's and Aunt Beru's in Episode 4, when he saw the two suns rising, that iconic shot from A New Hope. Really? The exact same shot. The exact same shot with the two suns, and the music cue is exactly the same as well before he dies. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Never caught that. That makes things feel more, even more full circle to his death. So we catch that, and then... So Luke is now gone. Luke yes. is dead. He's one with the Force now. We won't say Which, dead, but one with the Force. Yeah. But we got back to, you know, going back to the, the bare 
ends of the resistance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, going back to this, we still, obviously, like, these little crystal foxes that yeah. they were running around the base. They actually served a purpose. And we they were, you know, Poe's sitting here wondering, like, where did they all go after a certain amount of time, yeah. after we get back to this? And we see one of them get, like, come back into the scene, well, it's just, and Poe sees him run off. Mm-hmm. And he gets the idea of having everyone follow him to f go towards... Whatever way they're getting out. Whatever way they were getting out. Mm -hmm. Which leads to them finding an exit. But, but covered by a bunch of rocks. completely blocked off by a bunch of rocks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What we see then is Ray Finally embraces the Force and she's able to take those rocks up. Which in that which moment makes too... us realize that, you know, Luke did what he did mm -hmm. as nothing more than a means of giving Ray enough time to get there and to get them out. And get in them that, out. in that moment too, Luke basically tells Kylo that, uh, before he disappears that the Jedi he, won't die. Yeah. I'm not the last Jedi, you know, there, there's more than one of us now. And, uh, yeah, Ray embraces that moment, which in this moment, by the way, the floating rocks are also reminiscent of empire with Luke's first moments. But, we also get Ray and Finn finally reunite. The first time they're on screen together this whole movie. Which, that was a great moment. Mm hmm But, then we get our little other sequences that they show in this. Like the end scene with that kid who they, who Finn and Rose talked to that gave the uh, ring to, I believe. Yeah, well, before that you jump into the that... symbol of the Resistance. Before you jump into that, we have that scene before that where, um... Uh, where Ray's on the ship with Leia, that last moment where the Resistance is together on, on the Falcon. And Ray tells, uh, Leia, you know, what are we gonna do now, you know? And Leia tells her that, you know, I think we have all we need in order to advance the Resistance, which, in that scene, um, Ray is holding the broken saber... Luke's broken saber. Is it a possibility that she's going to build her new, her own lightsaber and construct that lightsaber back together? I think so. I think so. But yeah, okay, so back to what you were saying. Yeah, the, the boy from Canto Bite. Yeah, the boy from Canto Bite. When he goes out, when they're, the kids are all there playing, and, you know, they get that one guy that comes up, yells at them to start getting back to work. Mm-hmm. It's just weird. You see this kid, just random kid. Bring the broom to his hand. Like, brings the broom to his hand, mm -hmm. what looks like the force. Right. And it's just one of those moments that kind of really makes you think. Like, are these, like, is it really just... The force just really is just out there to everyone. Like, is it not exclusive just like the major families... Yeah, it, the Force is out there more so in people. I mean, think of it this way. This kind of goes back to way, the way Anakin was conceived. You remember, when, when Qui-Gon had asked Anakin's mother, Shmi, you know, who was his father? And she says, you know, there was no father. And I, 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 I was pregnant with him, I had him, and I raised him. I think it's almost a callback to that in the sense that maybe the Force is making these people. You know, it's possible. May, may, maybe there's something like that. Again, I think we got to find out more about that, and I think we are due to find more about that. I mean, Ryan Johnson definitely leaves J.J. Abrams with a lot to, a lot to explain in nine. But it was this last picture that we get in the film, which you couldn't help but ha have everyone in the theater stand up and clap. And that was the in memory to Carrie Fisher. Oh, of course. And this is and this is this is with really um, this was gonna be really difficult with for J.J. Abrams because everybody keeps saying you know now that you know Leia didn't die in eight, you know how are they gonna handle Leia's death because or because it's she's a part of the resistance at the end and she's very much a part of everything. I think the only explanation here is there's gotta be a time jump number one, time jump maybe and then they're gonna have to say Leia probably passed away of old age, or she died, or maybe she became one with the Force like Luke did, you know? And then also, too, I think there needs to be a time jump because there needs to be time for Rey to have grown her powers and also for Kylo to have grown and taken more control of the First Order. 
Yeah. All right, so now it's the point where we have to come up with our theories as to what's going to happen in this last film. Um. Yeah. Oh, before we do that too, we we want we want to revisit um our predictions we made at the end of the Force Awakens. Um. I mean, there's not much to really explain here. I think what was our first question? Um, who Snow's identity was? Well, neither one of us are right about that because we because don't find, we don't that find out. out who. Ray's we parents. Just see we get, we get to the point where we're supposed to see it, and oh, he's dead. Right, which we think is going to come in nine. But Ray's parents, we ended up being both wrong as of right now, and ended up being neither one. We said, um, and it just turns out that they're deadbeats. Right. Um, we both got the ending wrong. We were both way off on the ending. So uh, I, I did say that a feeling that Luke was going to. You did say that. Yes, you were right about die Luke dying. In this film. Um. It's funny. You were right about Luke dying, and I said he was going to live, and then I was right about Leia surviving when you said she was going to die. So yeah. we we had a split on that. Um, and then we were both wrong on the ending. I mean, we were way off on the ending. The ending didn't end any way we thought it would. So really, we were wrong about a lot of shit. All right, so let's get our theories in for... Episode 9. nine. <sighs> well... Um, again, like I said about the time jump, I think that's going to be important. I think we're going to find out more about Snoke, and that's only because lately I read more into this visual dictionary, The Last Jedi, was was released, and Snoke wears this ring that apparently is an old Jedi relic that is somehow connected to Palpatine and Vader, and possibly Plagueis, and that maybe he was waiting for his right time to take over, and that he became one with the Force, training himself to develop on his own. So I think that J.J. Abrams intends on explaining Snoke more because he created the character, so I think it only makes sense that he knows who he is in his mind. So, with that, I think, I'm with you on that, we're going to find out more about Snoke. That wasn't the end of Snoke that we saw no, I think there's in more The Last to it. Jedi. There's going to be more to it. We're going to find out the true identity of Snoke in 9. Yeah. As much as I like to joke about it, I can't even agree anymore with my own theory. I have to rebuttal, take, make a rebuttal on my theory about Snoke. Okay. You taking back the Jar Jar thing? Yeah. Okay. As much as I want to believe it, I can't really say that anymore. No, not at this point. Well, not even that. It's I just have a very strong feeling that you were right in that it is Plagueis. Starting to feel more and more like it, and I think that that whole ring thing is really starting to kind of develop that theory even more so. Because if what you're saying is true here, that would really mean it would have to be pla- It almost makes perfect sense for it to be Plagueis because mm-hmm. he's already cheated death how many times? That's a good point because that's why we good reason why maybe he didn't die here because he, remember he and said he could cheat death supposedly was killed by Palpatine, mm-hmm. but if it turns out he wasn't, means he would have cheated death yet again. Mm-hmm, with this, and he'd come right back. For and then cheated get a third time with... With Kylo. Kylo. Yeah. So there's that. And that, but what I personally think is that Kylo's still going to turn at the end. You think he's still going to turn good? The, he's going to... It's going to be the a la Vader route. Could be. Where Could it's be. gonna be like right before he dies. Mm-hmm. Um Because everything is leading up to Kylo see, making it seem like Kylo Ren is the ultimate villain in In nine. Yeah, the he, end he's, game he's, here. he's the he's the villain. Um I wanted to ask too, um we might as well provide our theories because episode nine is more than likely gonna be the last chapter of the Skywar- Skywalker saga. So my question to you is, if you had to predict now what you think the final scene of the whole saga is going to be, what would you say it would be? Ooh, that is a, that is a good question. Mm-hmm. If I had to take a guess, I think it's going to be involving... What I believe, what I'm going to go into my theory, what next theory here is, and my next theory being is that we're going to find out that that was all a lie 
about Ray's parents, mm-hmm. I I refuse to believe that that's how they're just going to leave it. Yeah, at something about Ray's parents seem... being just deadbeats that sold her off for money. Right. I think that we're going to find out that she actually is a Skywalker. Okay. Obviously, I don't. I still think she's uh, Ob or not Ben, but Han and uh, Leia's daughter. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think the last scene is going to be where she finds out that she's pregnant. Well, who's the father? We won't ever know. I think it's going to be though that the Skywalker line is going to continue on. Okay. But that's going to be the end. That's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I mean, yeah, I mean that that's a very realistic a very realistic ending. I uh, think that's going to be the end, but that's going to be how the whole Skywalker saga ends. saga ends is you know finding out that the the whole the lineage of the Skywalkers isn't over. Over. Right. Um, my theory is, I've kind of envisioned this last shot, um, is I thought the last shot would be kind of cool that I think we would find out that Ray, Ray was the balance and the force that was always being looked for in the whole saga. Yeah. Um, and like the last sequence would be her basically taking on Luke's role, training a new group of Jedi, basically a lot of these kids that we see at the end of eight, you know, and forming this whole new Jedi Order. And I think that the the very last shot would be cool of, like, seeing the new Jedi Order formed. And, like, over the ridge, we see the Force ghosts of, you know, Obi-Wan, Anakin, uh, Yoda, Luke. Luke. And you can, even, you can even throw Leia in there. They have seeds, they have deleted footage from this movie that they could redo a, a, a Force Ghost version of Carrie Fisher. And they're all kind of overlooking it, and they're all finally realizing that we finally found the balance in the Force, and the Jedi Order will continue on because she finally is the balance, and they're all kind of happy, and that would be your last shot. Well, I agree with that, but there's also another theory I have with that, and that's similar along the lines of what you're doing, what you're saying here, Mm -hmm. but it's the establishment, finally, finally, of the Grey Order. Yeah, I know you've talked about the uh, the Grey Order, and uh, will it ever come into play with this? I don't know. The dual blue and blue or green, and then the red lightsaber. It, one hand holds the blue or green lightsaber, the other holding the red one. Mm-hmm. Them all wearing the gray cloaks. They are the true balance of the Force. That would be yeah. I mean, you could basically do what I said, and then but have them be be that. Yeah, that would be the ultimate balance. You're right. That would be just right to do it that way. This is, it's, 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 I, I'm hoping that a lot of where our minds are at, I hope J.J. Abrams is in that same frame of mind. I hope he is. A lot of people are concerned right now that maybe he's going to go too far off and, you know, somehow duplicate Return of the Jedi a little bit. And I'm hoping that he doesn't. I don't think that he will. I think that he probably listened to some of the criticism from Force Awakens, and it's not going to make that same mistake twice. Alright, so... Is there anything else we have left to discuss, really, here? I don't think so. I think the only thing we got to discuss is what we or what our overall rating of the movie is and where maybe it ranks within the, the saga. So, I'll go with you first. What do you think, Mike? Um, What would you rate this overall? Well, first of all, I, I, I almost refuse to compare it to Force Awakens because they both feel like two totally different films, and I don't even know if it's fair to compare the two. But I'm going to give this movie probably an 8, um, because uh, there are some things like the Snoke and the parents thing that kind of peeved me, but I think overall the movie is entertaining. It drives the story forward, takes it in directions you didn't expect, um, and provides a direction that's unpredictable going into 9. Uh, episode 2 still remains my favorite, so I guess maybe in the whole slew of the whole saga where it ranks. Um, I mean, my, my order still goes uh, two, two, one, three. Uh, I said 5, 
five, seven, eight, four, six. So you're still well on your kick of six was easily the worst movie of the series. You know, I never want to say the word worst. I just think Return of the Jedi. I don't enjoy that one as much as any of the others. And right now, I, I rank Last Jedi below Force Awakens right now, but that may eventually change, and I may trump it over in time. All right, so what I'm going to say here, uh, to me, makes perfect sense. It may not make sense to you or any of you guys listening to this right now, but overall, I would rate this film probably about eight, eight and a half. Mm -hmm. I thought this movie was done so well. Mm -hmm. I thought this was a hell of a lot better than The Force Awakens. But at the same time, The Force Awakens, I thought, was a better movie. Mm -hmm. With, along the lines of, it has a negative negativity to it in the fact that The Force Awakens just felt like it was a plateau. It was a safe movie it, with yeah. how they did this. Yeah. It was good the entire way through. There wasn't any... But they also didn't really take any risks at all, it felt like to me. In Force Awakens? In Force Not Awakens. like the risks they took here. No, so that made it an overall safe movie. It was a lot better. It was better in the fact that it was good. It was good just throughout. I would still rate The Last Jedi higher, mm -hmm. even with all of the bad that I thought there was in this movie, mm -hmm. compared to all of the good. And the reason why I would rate it so high above The Force Awakens is because the good that was in this film mm -hmm. was just that damn good. Right. All of the acting sequences between Daisy Ridley, mm -hmm. Adam Driver, Mark Hamill, and who was it that played Snoke again? Andy Serkis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Andy Serkis. Those... Those actors, the roles that they did, the way that they did these roles, especially Luke re redoing his, reprising his role after as long as it's been right. since he's last done this. Mm -hmm. It was just brilliant. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you, and you know the thing of it is too is like I I but I've been on the fence about about what I which movie I think is better between Force Awakens and this one, and and, and as I've been thinking about it and seeing it numerous times. I, I, even though I've been, like I said before, I'm putting Force Awakens for Last Jedi. To me, I don't even really want to do that. I kind of want to put both movies side by side in the same spot because, like I said, the differences and what both movies did were different, or one felt a little safer, or one took more chances. Yeah. And that's why I don't think it's even fair to even rate one over the other. So I'm, I'm going to basically say that I'm going to put them side by side to each other, and I think I will not fairly be able to categorize them in order how I like them until Episode Nine is there, so we have the three of those to kind of bridge the whole story together to see how they mesh. Yeah. But yeah, I'm agree with you. The performances were good. Uh, this is the most beautiful looking Star Wars movie. I mean, the, the, way, the way the movie's filmed, the colors, the, the cinematography, the effects, by oh, far. I one agree. of the best looking Star Wars movies. So, yeah, hey, I'm with you 100% on that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think we're both in agreement with where we stand on the movie and where our ratings are. And uh, very strong movie. And as far as... as the, where I rate this in... You know, context of uh, all of the other movies, like where would I place this as one of my favorites? I honestly don't know. I'd have to go through and look at all of the key points I had for all of the other films mm -hmm. and figure out where exactly I would place this. Because right now, I don't really have a place. It's tough. For it. It's tough right now. It's tough. Um, but uh, so for now, people, this is going to end any talk that we're going to have for Star Wars for a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was only one more point I wanted to make about it before we end the show. Yeah. Um, the last point I wanted to make, too, is that, um, you know, I, for weeks, for the last week, I've been reading all the criticism on this movie, and I want to set the record straight. I think a lot of the criticism is very unfair. I think that people have basically, you know, there was a petition out there saying that, you know, we should remake Episode Eight, this movie, and eliminate it from canon and, and redo it. And I think that is completely I think absurd. That is, that is absurd. There's it, it, no rhyme or reason to it. It's absurd. It. And for people to think that Luke's character is different here, it's not. My God, the movie was still good. Was still amazing. 
Yeah, that's my whole point. It's like Luke was not different. Luke is is aged. He's different because he's been around a lot. So anybody that thinks that, go back and watch the movie again and reevaluate it. Because if you think that, then you don't know Star Wars as well as you think you do. But Plain and simple. All right, so we're gonna come to the close of this particular podcast here. Um, mm-hmm. We are gonna be done, obviously, with Star Wars for a while. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about we, we we could revisit the other movies um, and do a Look, retrospective somewhere when down Han the Solo line. when Han Solo maybe comes out in May. Maybe. Yeah, and but but um, I mean the next big series that we'll get into is gonna be uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Yeah, we want to. Um, start... We're gonna get into mainly. It's gonna be uh, the next Avengers movie that comes out. We're gonna start getting heavily into it, but at some point we're gonna end up going on about. The uh, just we're gonna do a retrospective of the Mar- the MCU as a whole. Yeah, what we'll general. do is oh, I think we're gonna we're gonna do kind of um do we're a gonna few kind movies. of split that into two different parts. Uh, Black Panther. We're gonna do everything pre Black Panther, and then we're gonna do another one post Black Panther. Yeah, to build up to uh, Infinity War. Yeah, we're gonna do that. We'll probably we'll try to throw in some other reviews of, other, of different things in the meantime, in the middle of it. Um, please send over requests of stuff because that'll really help us. You know, want us to know what the viewers, what you viewers and listeners want to want to be reviewed and listened to. So please send those along because that'll definitely help us in doing future shows. And as for right now, I have a couple of movies in particular that I want to talk about next. Uh, if we don't hear any suggestions from you guys, this, these are a couple of movies that I would like to do. I would like to do, obviously, a review of the Christopher Nolan Batman series. Yep, absolutely. Nice to revisit those. And I say we get away from, you know, the sci-fi, the fantasy, and uh, something a little different. We start delving into all of the other genres here. Oh, absolutely. I yeah, say we, we to... go into something like Saving Private Ryan. Yeah, we'll do some war stuff. Maybe we'll divulge into some, some horror franchises, too, um, and different things. But yeah, I definitely want to bridge out and, and, and definitely start doing other other big, even big hits like Saving Private Ryan and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so please, everybody, please send us stuff along because that'll really help us. Because right now we're coming up with stuff that we want to do. But we want also to know what you want to hear because, you know, you guys are our listeners and we want you guys to listen to stuff that you want to know as well. So um, we'll be starting those soon. Uh, what we'll have coming, you'll stay updated on our Facebook page. We'll let you know what's coming up next and when it will be posted. Um, and please send us suggestions along because we need those. And please subscribe and don't forget to do that because, you know, you don't subscribe, we don't have followers, and you make us cry. You make him cry, not so much me. Oh, he'll weep at night, don't worry. Alright, but, again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Jason Kapasik. And I am Mike Winkler, and we'll This see has you. been Lights, Camera, Action, the podcast. And, um, that's a wrap. And we'll see you on our next podcast soon.